what happened to Brad Singer. Pete Ham was born in Swansea, Wales, the third of three children. He began playing the mouth organ at age four and then turned to the guitar in the 50s. He got his first guitar in 1959 and formed the Panthers with two friends. In 1965, Mike Gibbons became the Ivy's drummer and helped push the band to a new level of proficiency. By 1966, they had a new manager in Bill Collins and were based in London. Collins encouraged the members of the Ivies to write their songs and by 1967, various record companies and producers expressed an interest in signing them. The Ivies were an R&B based band from Wales that auditioned for the newly formed Apple Records label in 1968. Mal Evans, the Beatles' longtime roadie, followed by Peter Asher, the head of A&R for the label, and finally Paul McCartney attracted the attention of the group. A debut single was selected in late 1968 in the guise of a Tom Evans original, Maybe Tomorrow. The record never became a hit in England or America, but it charred high in Holland and Germany. The album passed with barely a ripple, never getting out in America and scarcely making it out in England, though it did get released in Germany, Italy, and Japan. The record's near suppression had nothing to do with artistic objections, but rather with the internal turmoil that Apple was going through at the time. The group's fortunes were rescued by Paul McCartney, who brought them a song he'd written called Come and Get It, as part of the proposed soundtrack for a movie called The Magic Christian. They ended up with a number 4 British hit single and a number 7 hit in America, with comparable sales throughout most of Europe. Ron Griffiths, whose girlfriend had given birth to their child in early 1969, quit the group midway through the recording of the music for The Magic Christian. The band used the opportunity to change its name, Badfinger, from the working title of the Beatles song with a little help from my friends, Badfinger Boogie. Tom Evans switched to bass in the course of recruiting a replacement member. Joey Mullen joined the newly named Badfinger just in time to play gigs in support of the release of Magic Christian Music, an LP assembled from the songs from the movie, augmented by remixed versions of the best songs from the Ivy's Maybe Tomorrow album. The new lineup was the strongest yet after some sorting out and Evans getting accustomed to working with the bass. Ham and Evans were already session songwriters who proved themselves able to write songs to order when they worked on the Magic Christian. Carry On To Tomorrow was a Crosby, Stills & Nash style harmony number with a high haunt count while Rock of All Ages was greeted as one of the best original British rock and roll numbers since the Beatles I saw their standing there. Badfinger were a hot rock act in 1970 and 1971, playing on many Apple associated sessions and working on John Lennon's Imagine album. They also recorded their best album, No Dice, which yielded one classic recording, No Matter What, and an original song, Without You by Ham and Evans. In 1970, the group first hooked up with agent Stan Polly, who eventually became their manager. Polly reorganized the group's finances, but ultimately saw virtually none of the money they were earning. The band toured America and saw the No Dice album get rave reviews, but they found some less than pleasing elements to their success once they realized how fixated American audiences were on their connection to the Beatles. They despised having to play Come and Get It and resented being asked more about their relationship with the Beatles than about their music. At the end of 1971, the group released Straight Up, which is generally regarded as their best album. It produced two huge singles, Day After Day and Baby Blue, plus an FM hit in the form of Name of the Game. However, the album was difficult to record, going through two producers. George Harrison and Todd Rundgren in the course of gained something usable. Additionally, the other band members, especially Mullen, felt that Straight Up didn't sound very much like Badfinger. Additionally, Apple was in a state of chaos, 
With Badfinger and the individual Beatles the only artists making any money for the company. Additionally, their new manager was making all kinds of moves involving their finances, supposedly looking after their interests, but effectively keeping their money from them. In early 1973, producer Chris Thomas was brought in to help them complete the album, a process that delayed its completion until the spring of 1973. The band was in an awkward, almost impossible situation with the record company. They negotiated a multi-million dollar contract with Warner Brothers, which upset the people in charge at Apple. However, their record label was in a state of rapid decline and Alan Klein was insisting on a less favorable contract. The group kept touring and writing and their final Apple album, Ass, was released late in 1973. The subsequent Apple bankruptcy and the settling of accounts would take many years and cost the group hundreds of thousands of dollars. Just weeks after working on their latest album at the time, they commenced work on a hastily conceived album, Badfinger, for which they had little enthusiasm. The group returned to the studio in early 1974, just as the first Warner Brothers album was dying in the marketplace and the reviews to cut Wish You Were Here. The album Wish You Were Here was a triumphant comeback for the group, but the financial moves involving the group's accounts broke to the surface. Millions of dollars were gone from a separate account set up to protect both the group and the record label, and Wish You Were Here was withdrawn weeks after its release in the fall of 1974. Gibbons had left the band for a time in late 1972, and now it was Ham's turn to exit the group. The mix of personalities and legal entanglements had grown impossible, with Polly controlling all of their income and huge amounts of money seemingly vanished. The year 1974 was the culmination of a series of events that would keep lawyers and accountants busy for years, and the individual group members found themselves impoverished and in debt despite their years of work. A third Warner album entitled Head First was hastily recorded by the group in late 1974 but was never released. By that time, the situation between the record label and the group had deteriorated, leading to the canceling of their contract in early 1975. On April 23, 1975, a year of big financial and professional crisis, Ham quickly short of money with no prospect of seeing any way that was owed to him, and with a daughter on the way, hanged himself in his garage. The group's affairs, already a shambles, had turned into a nightmare. The surviving group members tried to put their personal and professional lives back together over the next few years, while the overlapping suits and countersuits went through the system on both sides of the Atlantic. In 1978, with the help of drummer Kenny Hark and guitarist Joe Tanzen, Evans and Mullen tried reviving the Badfinger name with the album Airwaves. Hark left during the recording of the album, as did Tanzen soon after, so the remaining duo hired ex Steelers wheel drummer Peter Clark and former Yes keyboard man Tony K to round out the group. They later toured America and a second album, Say No More, followed in 1981, but there was little stability to any of these latter day versions of the band. Evans, Molland, and Gibbons had an on again, off again relationship, and at different times were fronting rival groups exploring the Badfinger legacy. The legal conflicts proved almost insoluble, as the members themselves disagreed with each other. Sometime early in the morning of November 19, 1983, after a loud argument with Molland over the telephone, Evans hanged himself. The irony was that there was sufficient demand for Badfinger material, that their albums were widely pirated on CD in the late 90s. Among the non-Beatles Apple CD reissues, the Badfinger albums were the only group of recordings that sold well enough to justify remaining in print into the 21st century. Mullen managed to entice and then alienate fans in the 90s with the release of a live Badfinger album from tapes dating back from the early 1970s, 
on which the drums and other instruments had been obviously redubbed. Various radio performances and concert recordings later surfaced, along with the documentary film Bad Finger from 1997, which recounts much of their story. Gibbons died in his sleep at his Florida home on October 4, 2005 at the age of 56. And then as of the recording of this video in April of 2023, Joey Molland is the only original member still alive. And that's what happened to Badfinger. Thank you for watching. Like and subscribe if you haven't already. Let me know who I should do next on this channel. Mention any facts that I failed to mention. And let me know if you think Badfinger is the most tragic story of a band of all time. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.